if you ever have a plan that changed on you anybody ever have a plan that changed on you like i thought i was going to go this way like say i don't know this whole last week <laughs> i don't know uh <laughs> yeah uh -huh. Um, plans aren't a bad thing. It's okay to have plans. Well, my plan changed for this week a little bit, uh, and not just in all of the ways that you know. <laughs> uh, but I decided I'm, I'm, uh, to put Genesis aside for an additional week. Obviously, the first last Sunday we couldn't meet at all. Uh, but today, you know, I, I, I was so I, I I got sick this past week. So aside from uh, no power, no heat, no water, which was a delight. Uh, I also, and so was Rachel. She got it first. She started it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I feel, I'm sounding like Adam. I'm back to Genesis. It wasn't me. Lord, it was this woman you gave me. <laughs> no, uh, it, it, it's not like she made sick. <laughs> Uh, but so she had it first and she was miserable for a couple of days. And then I, I had it for, a, you know, I had a good handful of days and was absolutely miserable. And as I'm lying in bed thinking about not feeling well and thinking about the power outage and boy, it's cold in here. And man, wouldn't it be nice if we could flush the toilet without having to haul water from the creek um, or, you know, set a bucket out in the rain or whatever and get water that way <laughs> all of the above uh, I began thinking about uh, what can we learn from all of this so today we're going to talk about some lessons from the ice storm uh, just a just a good three very simple lessons uh, that I want us, to, want us to kind of focus on as we move on out of this season of having been without the power, without the heat, without the water, and man, it's cold in here and all of that sort of stuff. So our big idea for today, our big idea for today is very simple. It's three very simple words. We are dependent. Did you notice <laughs> The, the instant that the power goes out and it's dark in there and it's starting to get cold, you're like, boy, I sure rely an awful lot on all of this stuff. I sure rely an awful lot on being able to flip a light switch and be able to see in my house at night. I sure rely an awful lot on those heaters to work so that I'm not shivering. I sure rely an awful lot on being able to just go to a faucet, turn it, and have water right there in my home. Hot water! Hot water! Do not underestimate the value of a little bit of hot water. Yeah, all of those things. But, but that is just almost, that serves as a little bit of a parable for us. There, there's this reality of our strong dependence that we can learn from this. We are very, very dependent people, which is fascinating. So as I'm reading that prayer request from the Julietta Village Missions Church in Idaho and them talking, their prayer request talking about people being resistant to the gospel because they're very independent. Well, that, I don't know if you've noticed, is true here. Uh, that is true of being human. We want to be independent. We want to uh, just, I want to call the shots myself. I want to be able to do all of the things that I want to be able to do without anybody else's say so or input or opinion. I want to be independent. But the fact of the matter is we're not. We're dependent. We depend on all kinds of stuff and all kinds of people. So I want to focus a little bit on that dependence lesson this morning and, and, and three, uh, I guess, elements or aspects of that. That as I'm, as I'm laying in bed awake, coughing my brains out, I, I'm, I'm thinking through all of this and going, you know what, there's, there's some lessons here for us to learn. So lesson number one, our first dependence is on God. Our first dependence is on God. Now, 
I would hope that would be obvious to us. And I think on an intellectual level, it is obvious to us. Right? Uh, if you just kind of think through the nature of reality and, and what it means to be a created being, which you are and which I am, God made us. That means we are dependent. That without Him, we're, we are not. Right? That's what the Gospel of John says. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Right? And uh, He was with God in the beginning, and then He made everything. There was not anything made that has been made that includes you. You know, if you're looking at one of those mall maps, you are here. You are made. You're a made thing. You're a made being. You're a made, created object in the universe that God created. Which means you're dependent. Our first dependence is on God. Our first dependence is on God. Let's, I want us to go a little bit deeper on this. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 64. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 8. Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 8. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 64, starting in verse 8. Well, just verse 8. But now, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. We are the clay. We have to remember that our position is not as the shaper, but as the shaped. You're shaped, you're formed, you're made, you are acted upon. Now, this does not mean, of course, that we are somehow inactive, right? It's an image, it's a picture, it's a metaphor that the Scripture is using to describe our relationship to God. But that our first action is yielding to God is yielding to the one who is the potter. I'm the clay. He's the potter. Now, if you think about that, if you've ever seen anyone working with uh, clay and they've got the little potter's wheel or whatever, I remember having to do something similar to that in, I think, like elementary school, or we actually went to, um, uh, we were on our big uh, trip, our big cross-country trip in 2015. We stopped at a place in, I guess, where was Connor Prairie? Where was that? What state was that in? Was that... It was in Indiana. Indiana. It was in Indiana. And what it was, was it was one of those kind of pioneer places where they had people dressed up in pioneer gear and acting and talking and, you know, portraying like they were in, these, in the pioneer times, right? And if you talk to them in modern terms and you say, well, I'm from over here, they would be like, I don't know where that is. Well, we're, we're from the Northwest Territory, we're, which is, you know, there was no Oregon at the time of that pioneer thing that they were doing there. So we're like, oh, wow, that's far away how did you get all the way back here and what are you doing? but there was they had all of these different shops and one of the shops was a pot making shop right where they had a gal working the the potter's wheel and forming clay pots that they would make and then they would fire in a kiln and then all of that sort of stuff but that's what our relationship to god is like I'm clay, you're clay. We are clay in the Father's hands as He shapes and He molds us for His purposes, which is a very dependent kind of image. I don't get to call the shots. I don't get to be the one who says, I am in charge, because I'm not. I am the clay. He is the potter. My first action is actually yielding to the potter. So we are the clay. You are the potter. God is the shaper. He is the one with a good, wise plan. We 
trust him, even in ice storms when we lose power. I have something that will help. Yeah. The word literally means to hang down from. Yep. Yep. Right. So we depend. We hang from him, his power, his strength. We need him. We need him. So uh, if you think about the time that you were in your home or wherever it was you were stuck after the ice storm and there was no getting out for most of us. Right? It's not like, well, I guess I'll just go into town. I'll make a trip into town and I'll get groceries. Nope, town was pretty well iced over and without power, too. In fact, parts of it still are. Right? Uh, Gabe's work at Hobby Lobby, they just got power back yesterday. Right? And, and that's in the gateway area, in the mall over there. But there's all of these places that are still without power. And that's this picture of complete dependence on God for us. Apart from the working of God upon our lives, we are nothing but chaotic lumps. That's what we are. We like to imagine we have something to offer God. Everything we have to offer to God is something he has first given to us. Right? In our salvation, the only thing we bring to the table is the sin that makes it necessary. In our lives of service to him, the only service we provide for him is based upon the resources of his Holy Spirit dwelling within us that he has given to us. The only power that I have to offer is power he has already supplied because I am dependent on him. Because I am dependent on him and you are dependent on God. You are dependent on God. So our first dependence is on God. Our chief, you might say, dependence is on God. Lesson number two. Our second dependence is on our church family. Uh, we, at least, were pretty greatly helped by a number of you. And which, by the way, thank you. <laughs> you know, some people brought us coffee. Some people brought us a generator and gas to run it. Some people gave us water in gallon jugs that we needed and, and a case of drinking water bottles. And it was just all, and for, because uh, there was a point at which the adults in the house were sick and unable to do for ourselves. A real picture of dependence, by the way. But we had other people whom God has brought into our lives and whose lives God has brought us into who were able to come alongside of us and to help. And we are very grateful for this. Very grateful for this because not only do we depend on God, but God has given us a church. And part of the reason God created the church is not simply so that we can get together for an hour, hour and a half on Sunday morning and jam together and hear me yap about the Bible for a little while. Those are good. I hope um, God brought us together because we need each other. I need you. I, I do. A and you need me and each other. This is how God designed the people of God to live and to function like a family because a, a child without a family is a what? Is an orphan. Is an orphan. Have you ever, has anybody here ever been to an orphanage like overseas? I know a couple of you have. I know you have. I didn't know you had. Interesting. Um, have you seen what's called failure to thrive? Yeah, you, can, you don't have to be in an orphanage overseas to see it too, do you? 
Nope, that, it happens here in the States. We actually known people who've, who've had, and that's somebody who's missing out on essential care in their life from a, 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 an adult, a loving, caring adult or a loving, caring family of some form, that they actually physically react and are physically unhealthy because they're not receiving the emotional care that they're getting from a family. And sometimes it's the physical um, uh, care of food and stuff like that. But failure to thrive is a real condition where a child will begin to physically suffer and can be in serious danger. Well, the, the fact of the matter is, is that that's true for the people of God as well. We need each other. And have you ever met one of those kind of lone wolf, on their own, crazy Christian dudes who is just like, I'm going to be by myself. I'll stand on a street corner. I'll have a placard and I'll have a megaphone and I'll yell angry things at people. And you're like... You need a church, buddy. You, you, need, you need a group of people who are not crazy, who can put you into check. Because what can happen is we can have failure to thrive as Christians. We can have failure to thrive as believers. We need a church family. Right? If you've ever met one of those people who will say, I can still be a Christian and not go to church. And one of my favorite memes that I've ever seen was, sure, the answer to that was, sure, just like a zebra that's separated from a pack of zebras and eaten by lions is still a zebra. You need the family because that is how God designed for it to work. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20 says this, Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Now, there's a fascinating little thing that is an assumption in that verse that is you're going to probably in some way surround yourself with some kind of person. The question is, what kind of person? Is, is every kind of person a good kind of person to associate with? Wise to associate with? Absolutely not, because there can be, shock of all shocks, bad influences. Even a generally smart human being can be influenced very badly into making exceptionally bad choices. Uh, we, we're fond of saying in our household, everybody is one bad decision away from making a string of bad decisions. Right? And, and sometimes all it takes is just the wrong person to come into your life as an influence to influence that one bad decision. Whoever walks with the wise will become wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise. God is forming a family called the church. One purpose for the church is to be a space where believers grow in relationship to one another in wisdom. That's why the Word of God is at the center, in many ways, of what we do. That's why there are sermons. Because this is the wisdom of God. And we need to soak in the wisdom of God with regularity. Because otherwise what will happen is we will soak in some other kind of wisdom. We, because you are bombarded every day by thousands of commercial messages. How many of you listen to the radio when you drive? How many of you listen to any kind of music when you drive? How many of you turn on a television and see commercials? So when you, yeah, no, not when you drive. Don't do that. That's not a good idea. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. Um, commercial messages. Uh, I, the, the estimate was you encounter at least 3,000 
images, messages a day. A day! And we absorb so much of that unthinkingly. And honestly, most of it is not wise. I'm going to give you a commercial message. It's three words long. Somebody tell me what it's for. Obey your thirst. Anybody know that one? Anybody? It's, 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 it's Sprite. Sprite. What happens if you obey your thirst exclusively with Sprite? You, you, you get dehydrated. <laughs> right? Yeah, obey your thirst, but like drink water every once in a while, would you please? Right? Uh, yeah, and there are, there are just thousands of these we could probably draw from and quote, and you would be able to go, well, that one's from that one, or that one's from that one. And you could pull old ones out, like old school, where's the beef? <laughs> yeah, I already got a couple of people laughing and a couple of people like, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, oh, what a relief it is. <laughs> right? Yeah. But those, it, how stuck in our minds are those things? Well, how stuck in our minds are things that are more subtle than that? That we've encountered on a daily basis. Things that are not wise. And so it is incumbent upon us as the people of God to engage with the Word of God so that, as, as David, King David said, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Hey? I have hidden your word in your, uh, my heart that I might not sin against you. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise. One purpose for the church is to be as that space where people, where believers grow in wisdom in relationship to one another. We have other hopefully growing wise among us. But the companion of fools will suffer harm. Not all companions are equal or deserving of our time. We must be careful not to confuse personal confidence or secular life experience with Christian maturity. I can't, I can't tell you how many churches I've been in or been a part of as a, as a pastor where I've come in and there's a person who's in charge of some ministry or a board or something like that. And the reason that they were put into that position is because they were a business leader in the, in the secular world. Um, that's not how we choose people to be in charge in the church. We actually have books in the Bible called 1 Timothy and Titus and 2 Timothy that are, that are letters to pastors that list qualifications for church leaders. And, and not a single one of them is, are they a good policeman? Are they a good um, whatever business person? Are they a good this, that, or the other? They're, it's all very specific qualification lists. But so many churches are like, well, how do we choose the chairman of our board? Well, I guess if, you know, they're, they've got a pulse and they know how to uh, run a meeting. No. Yeah, spreadsheets are, are not qualifications for church leadership. I've had church board chairman say to me, um, the Bible isn't really that interesting to me. I just think you should just not be a jerk to one another. Um, step down right now. R like right now. If you are not interested in the Bible, you are not interested in what God has to say. And that's kind of the whole reason why we're here. Because we want to know what God has to say. 
We want to know what God has to say. If you walk with the wise, you will become wise. But he whose companions of, is fools, they will suffer harm. They will suffer harm. We need other people in our lives because life is not solitary. How many of you had a solitary moment this week? You know, a few too many, right? Some of us. Some of us were like, I can't get away from these other people. <laughs> but we must be wise about whom we will allow to influence us. And that's why God is forming a church family. Lesson number three. God is beyond the storm and to be found in stillness before him. And this is an outworking of... How are we dependent on God? How do we exercise dependence on God? So, um, I, I was as I was laying in bed at like four o'clock in the morning one night, and not able to get to sleep. Um, I was reminded of a particular moment in the Bible. It's one of my favorite moments with uh, the prophet Elijah, who has just had a resounding success against the prophets of Baal. All right, you know that one. And uh, right after that resounding success, there's this awful queen who threatens him, who says, you know, if, um, if I don't make you like one of them, because all the prophets of Baal are dead because he's killed them. Uh, if I don't make you like one of them, if I don't kill you, then may all of that be on my head, like I'm, I'm in trouble. So that's her swearing, I'm going to destroy you, Elijah. And that throws him. Like he, feel, he feels like he's just had this great moment, this great success, and all of a sudden his life is under threat and he doesn't understand what's going on. And so what does Elijah do? He runs. He runs, he goes to a mountain and, and the, really the reason he goes to the mountain is so that he can resign, so that he can quit. God, I'm done. I'm out. I don't want to do this anymore. You know, there are, there, I'm the only one left is what he says to God. It's just me. And God says, no, it's not. But there's this fantastic moment. I love this moment. In 1 Kings chapter 19, 11 through uh, 13. And I'm sure you've seen it. I'm sure you've read it. I'm sure you've heard it at least. But it's so good to remember. 1 Kings chapter 19, starting in verse 11. And uh, so this is God speaking to uh, Elijah. And he says, and he said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. Or some of your translations will say a still small voice. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there was a voice. Uh, uh, there came a voice to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Uh, there was a wind, um, a, a storm, if you will. And God was not in the storm. There was an earthquake. God was not in the earthquake. There was a fire. We've had those, remember? 
Anybody remember those? The wildfires? We all had to flee for our lives. But the Lord was not in the fire. Right? So what is, what is that? There are these things. The Lord passes by. These things happen, but the Lord is not in them. What does that mean? Now, how many times have you, have, has there been some sort of national tragedy? Some sort of national disaster? Something happens somewhere, it's terrible, there's a mass shooting, there's a 9-11 that happens, and some, some idiot preacher gets on TV and says, see, he murdered us. Just like that. <laughs> right? What they're doing is they're looking in that thing and saying the Lord is in that. Now, I'm not saying the Lord didn't cause or permit or ordain those things. He absolutely does all of those with all of those. Okay? The ice storm would not have occurred without the ordination of God. Your power outage and mine would not have occurred without God making it so. But I want us to be very careful about trying to draw a specific message out of that, because I think that's where the mistake occurs. That's where the mistake occurs. What is God telling us by sending this ice storm? Hold on, because there's something else that happens in the Elijah narrative. It is after the disastrous moments that there comes the low whisper, the still, small voice. God was not in the wind, the fire, the earthquake, or the ice storm. We often expect God's voice to boom in disastrous events. But what if those are sometimes just the preparation for him to get word to us on something? Now, what do I mean by that? There's the sound of the low whisper, the still small voice. What if God does not want to shout to be heard over everything that we have buzzing in our lives? The power, the running water, the internet, TV, radio, this thing I have to get to, I'm late for that and I've got to get to it. How distracted are we, by the way? What if God does not like speaking into distraction? What if he likes to clear the path first? What if, he, what if he's trying to get us to shut up long enough so that we can listen? Think about that. What did we have a lot of after the ice storm besides ice and broken tree branches? Stillness. A lot of us were very still. We weren't going anywhere. We didn't have the constant hum of the lights. We didn't have the constant blaring of TV or the internet or whatever else going on. What if that stillness was a gift? And did we squander it? <laughs> we shivered it. Psalm 46, verses 1 through 11. This is the entirety of Psalm 46, actually. Um, there's a verse here that I, I'm wanting to get to, and in fact, it's a verse that, at least for some, is a popular 
verse that's about peace and nice and calm, but we forget the context, which is why I'm reading the entirety of Psalm 46, all 11 verses. Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though, the, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its, dwell, at its swelling. Selah. Now, um, I want to make a brief comment about that word Selah. You will see that throughout the Psalms. Um, to the best of our understanding, that's a word that means something to the effect of, okay, now stop and just think about that. Stop and think. Stop and consider. The Lord is our refuge, our, our ever-present help in time of trouble. Though this happens, though this disaster goes on, though the mountains do this, though the seas do this and roar, though the ice storm comes and it gets slippery outside. Selah. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. So the, the answer there to, to what the identity of the river is, it's God himself. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when the morning dawns, the nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars to cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. And here's the verse that is often taken out of context. It's just sort of like put on a wall hanging or something. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will exalt in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. The context that is throughout Psalm 46 is trouble. The context of Psalm 46 is natural disaster and political turmoil, which we know things about, do we not? We absolutely know all kinds of stuff about those because we've seen those. We've experienced those recently. But in the midst of this discussion of disaster that's scary, that's outside, that makes it, you know, are we going to be warm ever again? And, and this picture of all of these wars that are going on, in the middle of all of that, what does God say? Be still. And know that I am God. So, what's the prerequisite to knowing God here? Stillness. Stillness. What did we have an awful lot of following the ice storm, barring ice and broken tree branches? Stillness. I, I will ask it again. What if that stillness was a gift? And did we squander it? Do you know what to do with stillness when you encounter it? We are um, addicted to movement. We're addicted to um, noise. We're, we're addicted to activity. We have, always have to be going, moving, doing. That does not leave a whole lot of room for stillness. And God says, be still and know that I am God. How do we depend on God when we're so busy, so active, depending on ourselves? Depending on power depending on heat, depending on running water.
if we're depending on all of those things, because we are naturally dependent creatures, we will find something to depend on. If we're naturally dependent creatures who will find something to depend on, how many times do you think we will naturally gravitate toward God? Not. We won't. That's not in our nature to do so because our first parents rebelled and put it into our nature to rebel. And that means we are naturally disinclined to sit in stillness before God and listen to Him. Now, when I say sit in stillness before God and listen to Him, what I don't mean is sitting like a guru on a mountaintop with the fingers cross-legged and going om and just kind of doing nonsensical, empty-headed stuff. That's not what we're talking about. You, to listen to God, you actually have to hear what God has said. Well, how do we do that? Well, how has God spoken? He's spoken in his word. He's spoken in his word. Um, <clears throat> he has spoken in his creation. The heavens declare the glory of the Lord. The skies pour forth speech night after night. So that his invisible character and quality, his divine power and nature are clearly known by the things that are seen. Romans. Um, we, we know God by knowing what he has made and that it, it testifies to his power. We know God by knowing what he has said and what he has revealed to us in his word. We know God by knowing the one whom he has sent to redeem us, Jesus Christ, by meditating on the person and work of Jesus Christ. So the, the book of nature, the book of revelation, his word, and the, the most personal revelation of God, Jesus Christ. So there's, there's general revelation, creation, nature. There's special revelation, the word of God. And then there's personal revelation, the person and work of Jesus Christ, which we know about through special revelation. Contemplate. Um, I, I would use the words contemplate. I would use the word meditate as long as we're trying to empty meditation of its sort of uh, funky Eastern context that is sort of uh, empty headedness and not thinking. It's absolutely meditation. Real meditation requires you to, to have content. OK, and content and content, the very person of Jesus Christ. Um, contemplation is just fine. Meditation, that word is just fine, barring any association with foolishness. But this is how we depend on God. We have moments of stillness. And God gave us plenty of stillness this week, guys. And, and, and if we haven't used that... Some of you weren't up at four o'clock in the morning thinking of a different sermon topic, and I get that. But what that may <laughs> entail for us is assessing our lives and saying, um, why isn't there room for stillness here? Why, isn't, why is there only room for activity? Maybe what we need to do is Stop and think. Selah. Be still and know that I am God. Stillness is often a necessary prerequisite to meeting with God because it teaches us that what we have to say is not anywhere near as important as what God has to say. Because we are dependent. 
because we are dependent. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the ice storm. Thank you for taking away our power, our heat, and our water temporarily. Thank you for restoring it. But we thank you most of all, Father, for reminding us that we need stillness before you. That we need quiet. That the Lord was not in the wind. He was not in the earthquake. He was not in the fire, but he was in that still small voice, that low, gentle whisper. Because you don't like to shout. Help us to listen to your voice in the things that you have made, in the word that you have revealed, in the son that you have given. We pray all of these things in your name. Amen.